So while uh, while we get our next speaker ready, I just wanted to address one question that was asked in the audiences. How do we decide about, can we comment anything about scans that are done? How do we pick between CT scans, MRIs, PET scans, and all of these other newer modalities that are available? And I think all of those, so we each test does different things. So an X-ray is probably the cheapest. It's the one that has the least amount of radiation, but it's also one that gives us the least information. So many of those, so we use X-rays, CT scans, PET scans, MRIs, ultrasound, and you saw some of the newer imaging that Alice mentioned in her talk, a lot of this really has to do with what information we are seeking and what would be the best. So for instance, when would we do a PET scan versus a CT scan? I think for the most part, CT scan with contrast gives us the best information that we can get. But if you have poor renal function and you're unable to get a good CT with contrast, then a PET is very valuable. Why don't we do a PET in everybody? I think it has to do with the amount of radiation. A PET scan carries a lot more radiation than a CT does. So I think it's always balancing what information information we want, what we can get, and what price you're going to pay for that extra information. So, so I wanted to talk a little bit, uh, introduce Tommy uh, Metzner, who's our uh, research coordinator extraordinaire, who joined Stanford many, many years ago. He has a very uh, personal story to say about why he got uh, interested in kidney cancer, but I would really say it's been a treat having Tommy uh, in our urologic oncology department. He's helped almost every one of us um, collect specimens, enhance our research. He helps uh, consent patients about why they should be engaged in clinical research. He helps collect uh, blood samples, tissue, biopsies, both um, in the operating room and has done tremendous work in helping many investigators here at Stanford. Our uh, personal hope, and I know Tommy's hope himself, is for him to become a physician one day, and I think he's inching every day closer towards that dream. He also, um, with his engagement, has helped us uh, helped he himself form this program, getting um, medical students and uh, pre-med pre students engaged in uh, research and coming to our clinic in urologic oncology. So Tommy is just going to talk a little bit about what he's done and his work in helping enhance our research here at Stanford. Can everybody hear me? Wonderful. Okay. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, hi, everybody. <laughs> um, I, I got to first start off by saying that this is one of my favorite events of the year. So it's wonderful to be back here and uh, have the opportunity to, to give a talk to you guys again. Um, and so exactly what Sandy said is I, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the research that we're conducting here at Stanford and specifically how we are acquiring and sharing knowledge about kidney cancer amongst the investigators, the physicians, and the scientists here at Stanford um, with the hopes of improving treatments uh, for kidney cancer patients. So first I'd like to introduce myself. Um, my name is Thomas Metzer, but everybody calls me Tommy, so you guys should as well. Um, feel free. And unlike uh, my colleagues who presented earlier, I'm not a physician. I'm a scientist. Uh, so I earned my bachelor's degree from uh, the University of California, San Diego, in human biology. I also have a master's of science in biotechnology from Johns Hopkins University. And specifically, I'm a clinical research coordinator and research associate. And so what I do is write and maintain clinical research protocols that allow us to conduct human subjects research here at Stanford. So I write the protocols. I communicate with the Stanford uh, Institutional Review Board. I uh, consent patients, maintain clinical databases, and then as a research associate, I also help develop novel science that's geared towards understanding kidney cancer. Um, so I run some experiments myself. I uh, help troubleshoot assays, um, analyze data, et cetera. And I've been doing all this for seven years in total with five years uh, committed to kidney cancer. 
So when we think about clinical research, there's really two approaches to clinical research. And what clinical research means is research that involves human subjects. So these two approaches are therapeutic and observational research studies. So therapeutic research studies are ones that likely all of you are familiar with, and these are also known as clinical trials. And so these are treatments that are outside of the standard of care in which data is collected on the research and on, the, on the, uh, the treatment itself for the duration of the study. That is, as long as the patient is receiving, say, a therapeutic drug or has undergone an experimental surgery. It's our hope that patients will benefit from these interventions. Um, that being said, that's not always a guarantee. And there's also, at times, a risk associated with those interventions, and those risks can be potentially very serious. In contrast, observational research studies are studies that involve the collection of information and data in the setting of a standard of care procedure. And so examples of observational research studies are studies that involve the collection of tissue, for instance, when a patient undergoes surgery, um, quality of life assessments and surveys, um, as well as epidemiologic data mining. And the beauty of these studies is that they can they can provide us with a tremendous amount of information about a particular disease at little to no risk to the patients and at very little cost to the researchers. So to run a, a clinical trial costs literally millions of dollars and many years for a drug company to perform that research. In contrast, observational research studies can be done with small grants um, led by investigators. They can be done in real time. Um, and as long as the investigator has the personnel and access to patients, um, we can gain a lot of information in a short amount of time. And so both of these approaches to research are incredibly important. Um, I myself, I conduct observational research. So I'm going to talk to you a little more about that. So at this point, you might be thinking, who is this guy? He's just some science nerd who is interested in kidney cancer, right? Maybe he doesn't care that much about patients. Well, part of that is true. I am a gigantic science nerd, so I'll say that up front. Um, but I care tremendously about kidney cancer patients. And to really illustrate that, I want to introduce you to the first kidney cancer patient I ever, I ever encountered. So this is Larry. Larry is, uh, well, one of the best men I've ever known, to be quite honest with you. Um, he was a Stanford alumnus, class of 1973. He graduated with honors from this university. He was also a very successful attorney and a philanthropist and was a pillar to his community in Alameda. He lived right here in the Bay Area. Of all the great things that Larry was, my favorite thing about him was that he was my uncle and he was like a second dad to me. Unfortunately, Larry was diagnosed with stage four renal cell carcinoma in 2010. He had metastatic disease at the time of his presentation he, went, he underwent a, uh, a heroic uh, bout with his disease involving numerous surgeries, um, spinal fusions, a number of systemic treatments, and unfortunately, he succumbed to his disease in December 2011. Um, at the time, I was working as a, uh, a research assistant at the Scripps Research Institute in San Diego, and I was studying cancer. and. Uh, during the course of his illness, I spent a lot of time with Larry. And before he passed away, I asked him, I said, if you could learn anything about kidney cancer, what would it be? And he had two answers. He said, number one, I want to know, why me? Why do I have this disease? I've taken good care of myself my entire life. I have no risk factors for kidney cancer, let alone any type of cancer. I have no genetic predisposition that I know of. Nobody in our family has ever had kidney cancer. So why am I, at 62 years old, why do I have stage four kidney cancer? The second question that he wanted answered was, is there a better way to assign drug treatments? Because in his words, there's got to be something better than this goddamn Sutent. <laughs> he was frustrated as all can be. And uh, you heard a little bit about Alex saying that we have a, uh, a trial and error approach, if you will, to assigning systemic therapies in which we give a patient a drug in hopes that it'll work and we re-image in 12 weeks 
And if it doesn't work, we give them a new drug. Well, is there a better way of going about that process and actually assigning therapy based on tumor biology? And so that was a big thing to Larry. That was a huge deal. And the answers to those questions can be provided through observational research studies. And so an example of what we're doing here at Stanford, an observational research study here at Stanford, is, is what Dr. Fan talked to you about. And this is a big project that I've been working on in which we sample tissue specimens from patients who are undergoing nephrectomy to treat their kidney cancer. We can run it through a fancy machine, and it will produce a very specific protein profile of what proteins are upregulated in a patient's tumor in the cells that actually comprise a patient's tumor. And it's our hope that if we can isolate these proteins from very small amounts of tissue, that we may be able to find drug targets and thus more effectively assign a patient a treatment based on the proteins that are upregulated in their tumors as opposed to just giving a very broad, uh, a, a broad drug in hopes that it will work. So this is an example of, of one observational research study that we're conducting. And if we, can, if we expand that, we find that these protocols are actually able to provide us with a tremendous amount of information, again, at no risk to the patients. So we can have a patient who comes in with a large renal mass, and if they're going to surgery, we can collect tissue specimens. If they have met metastatic disease, we may collect blood samples in hopes of isolating circulating tumor cells, which are cells that have broken off of the main tumor entered into a patient's vascular system and are by that means circulating around and that's essentially the route for metastasis or the spread of a patient's kidney cancer outside of their kidney. Along with those types of studies, we may also collect urine and blood as a way of uh, seeing if we can find a patient's kidney tumor or an indication that they have kidney cancer based on biomarkers that are in their blood or in their urine that would prompt a CT scan as opposed to having an incidental finding of kidney cancer in which we find it on a CT scan when we're looking for something else like a back injury or kidney stones or abdominal pain. Can we find these tumors earlier and can we treat them earlier when they're more surgically manageable and when they haven't spread outside the kidney? Along with those types of studies, we can also collect information from a patient's medical record and uh, compile large databases for patient outcomes and assessing what types of uh, risk factors a patient might have for developing kidney cancer, who gets kidney cancer, and you know, if a patient receives a certain type of treatment, what is their outcome likely to be? And we can also collect these uh, tissue specimens, put them into mouse models, and test drugs and see if a particular type of drug is more uh, effective at treating uh, kidney cancer than, say, another drug, and we can also understand the biology of metastasis. And the, the formation of all of these clinical research studies and the implementation of these research practices has provided the infrastructure for the kidney cancer research program here at Stanford. So the kidney cancer research program utilizes an umbrella of observational uh, clinical research studies to provide in information to a consortium of kidney cancer researchers here at Stanford. And these researchers are both physicians and scientists from multiple disciplines across the university. And what we all have in common is that we're all interested in kidney cancer. And through the kidney cancer research program, we're able to meet and share information so that we can more effectively study this disease. And so we have folks in the research program like uh, Alice Fan and Wendy Fantel here on the right who are studying um, ways to predict response to a particular therapy. You saw Dr. Lepper earlier, uh, myself, Dr. Jim Brooks. We're interested in proteomics uh, and molecular and cellular biology. You have Dr. Srinivas, Dr. Chung, who you've heard from. They maintain a uh, kidney cancer database here that's just full of clinical information on patients with kidney cancer so that we can assess trends large, in large populations of kidney cancer patients. Um, Dr. Amato Giaccia and uh, Aaron Rankin, they're studying drug targeting and resistance. And then we also have specialists who have developed animal models that are incredibly effective at uh, mimicking kidney cancer in a mammalian system. And we can, trust, we can test drugs on those, uh, those tumors that we implant in these mice. And so uh, Dean Felsher, Jeffrey Gertner, and uh, Dr. Donna Peel are, are instrumental in that. 
And this uh, group meets twice a month, and we just talk about kidney cancer. And it's a, it's a means by which we are getting everybody in the same room, a meeting of the minds, if you will, to really approach this disease in a way where we can utilize our strengths to overcome the challenges and the hurdles of studying a cancer that is as complicated as kidney cancer. And along with the, the uh, kidney cancer research program, I'm really proud to announce a project that I took on and founded myself. So the Larry and Diana Lulofs Memorial Kidney Cancer Research Internship is an internship I started in memory of my Uncle Larry. Um, initially, it bore only his name, but I changed it because uh, in February of this year, unfortunately, my Aunt Diana, who is Larry's wife, um, succumbed to her own battle with lung cancer. And though she wasn't a kidney cancer patient, I added her in because there was no greater caregiver to Larry than his wife. Excuse me. And uh, so this, is, this has really been my brainchild. And I, I founded this program, and I'm proud to say that it is up and running here. And so what it is, it's a six-month paid internship for Stanford undergraduates. It's available to all undergraduates except for freshmen um, because we want students to have some, uh, some collegiate uh, science co coursework under the belts before they start this program. Um, and it provides a three-month clinical rotation followed by a three-month research rotation that's geared towards studying kidney cancer. So during their clinical rotation, the students uh, shadow physicians, uh, specifically oncologists and urologists in the GU oncology clinic, as well as in the operating room, learning about kidney cancer, understanding treatment paradigms for this disease, and meeting kidney cancer patients and their families so that they can understand, really understand the challenges associated with this, with this disease. Following their clinical rotation, the students uh, take part in a research rotation in which they work on a translational research project with one of the members of the kidney cancer research program that's aimed at improving treatments for kidney cancer. And this program has two aims. Number one, it's to increase in the awareness and interest in renal cell carcinoma for future physicians and scientists. And it's also geared towards facilitating students getting into doctoral programs. And specifically, this program places an emphasis on underprivileged students here at Stanford who otherwise would not be able to acquire time working with physicians, being able to do research, um, et cetera. And at, at the core of this project are observational research studies um, that really allow students to um, gain this information. So I'm proud to say that in 2017, we graduated two students, two outstanding interns through this program. So on the left is Jasmine Kamrudin. She's from the Stanford class of 2019. And on the right is Caitlin Lagatuta, who is the Stanford class of 2018. And Caitlin's actually sitting right there. And she's my latest superstar. So big round of applause. She completed the program last month. And so I want to introduce these remarkable women. A little bit about Jasmine. She was born and raised in South Central Los Angeles. This is a picture of her and her mother at her high school graduation. Uh, Jasmine's mom is a paraplegic, and as a teenager, she helped take care of her mother. So she has one of the most profound senses of, of caring and compassion for other, other people I've ever met from a young person. Um, her majors are political science and African American studies. Uh, she was the first in her family to attend college, and she completed the uh, Lulofs internship in June. She worked with me from January to June of 2017, and her future goals are to go to medical school and earn a medical doctorate. Hello. Sorry. There we go. And a little bit about Caitlin. She's from Davis, California. Her major is computer science. Uh, she actually did a condensed form of the Lulofs internship. So she worked three months, but she did twice the amount of time in a week that a normal intern would do. So typically, they do 12 weeks. She did 24. And she did it over the course of the summer while studying for the MCAT, I will say. Um, she completed the internship, like I said, in September. and. Uh, Interesting thing about Caitlin, she was a three-year varsity athlete. Um, she's a softball player here at Stanford. Um, her future goals are to go to medical school and uh, 
also to potentially earn a PhD. So as I said, uh, they start with they start with clinical rotations, and uh, initially they they undergo a mastery of the literature. So they're required to learn about the biology of kidney cancer, understand its treatment paradigms, and then they start working with physicians. And these are this is a picture of uh, both of these ladies. On the left is Jasmine observing an open partial nephrectomy in the operating room. And on the right is Caitlin. She's observing a robotic partial nephrectomy. She's sitting at a teaching console that we actually have in the operating room for our residents. So the attending physician is operating at a similar console, and she's able to look in and see the exact view that the surgeon is seeing. She's obviously not operating, um, but she gets to observe. And these are incredible experiences that the majority of uh, undergraduates at Stanford don't get to experience. Uh, these ladies are in surgery or were in surgery typically one case a week. Um, so they'd spend one day in the operating room, splitting their time in the OR, and then one to two days in the clinic working with uh, medical oncologists and urologists and working with patients. And then following their clinical rotations, they undergo a research rotation. And so Jasmine worked in the lab of Alice Fan. She was mentored by Dr. Christian Horner, who's a staff scientist and, and the lab manager for the FAN lab. Um, specifically, she was interested in investigating mechanisms of drug resistance. So why a drug is initially efficacious and then loses its ability to uh, inhibit a patient's cancer. So she worked on that for three months. Um, she also presented her work at the GU Oncology Translational Research Meeting. And part of the requirements for this program is that the student must give one public talk on their work so that they can gain their voice and they can get used to sharing information and contributing to the field. Uh, Caitlin, on the other hand, she worked in the laboratory of Dr. Christina Curtis. She was mentored by Jose Sion, who's a, a postdoc in Dr. Curtis's lab, and she's interested in genomics. So she studied uh, and is studying uh, mechanisms by which gene expression could potentially be associated with uh, the development of metastatic disease. And uh, the faculty in the urology department loved her work so much that she will be speaking at next month's uh, Grand Rounds, which is a big deal for an undergraduate to be presenting at surgical Grand Rounds with the urology department. So the gist of this story is that the future is bright as far as research is concerned on kidney cancer at Stanford. Um, the Stanford Kidney Cancer Research Program is facilitating collaborations and co cooperative grant writings um, that we're hoping will lead to knowledge being presented to the field that's going to improve treatments for this disease. Um, we're also providing future physicians with an understanding of this disease. We're educating young people. And uh, most importantly, we are inspiring young scientists. And the proof is really in the pudding with this, because both interns have chosen to continue their work in kidney cancer research even after completing their internships. So Caitlin has just been brought on by the Curtis Laboratory as a research assistant, an undergraduate research assistant. And Jasmine is currently at the University of Oxford completing um, an internship on public policy. She'll then be working in DC on health policy in the winter. And when she returns in the spring, her hope is to continue her work with Dr. Fan. And Dr. Fan has, uh, has confirmed that that is a possibility. So she's going to come back, and she'll be working on kidney cancer when she comes back um, in the fall, excuse me, in the spring. And so with that, um, I want to say a, a tremendous thank you to all of our patients and their families, um, everyone who participates in this, in this research, whether it's uh, observational research or whether it's therapeutic research. You're really providing information that is invaluable to us and is going to help future patients, certainly. And uh, it's also providing a mechanism of of training and educating the future generations of kidney cancer physicians and researchers. Um, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. And if you'd like more information um, on the Stanford Kidney Cancer Research Program or the LULOFS internship, you can follow the two links up top. Also, if you're interested in uh, looking into therapeutic uh, clinical research studies, i.e. clinical trials, you can find those at clinicaltrials.gov. Or uh, the bottom website is a uh, clinical trials website uh, for trials that are available here at Stanford. And I'm happy to take any questions. You 
mentioned that you were doing observational studies, and one of the things you did was to take tissues? Yes. Okay. So if you've already had um, a partial nephrectomy, is there a way of getting tissue or doing some kind of blood work that could determine the prognosis of future metastasis? Currently, okay. currently no, but that's exactly what, we're, what we are investigating. So I would say that in, an interesting approach to that, for example, uh, we had a study going in, in which we were collecting blood specimens from patients who were undergoing nephrectomy, partial and radical nephrectomy. So we would collect blood um, at the time of surgery before the, the tumor was resected. Um, so we would get that from the patient's arterial line in the operating room while they were asleep from a line that they have in already. And then in the days following their surgery, when they were recovering in the hospital, we would also draw blood and analyze that for circulating tumor cells. So what we were trying to decipher was, uh, did they have, uh, were there tumor cells that were present in the blood before they went to the operating room? And then were there, was there a change in the numbers of, of cells uh, after the tumor was resected? So that would be a potential approach to answering that question. You could also take a look at um, cell-free DNA, so levels of DNA that are present in a, in a patient's blood uh, pre and post surgery. And if you don't see a change, then you could potentially theorize that maybe they have micrometastatic disease. Unfortunately, none of these assays are at a point where we can utilize them to make clinical decisions. That's why they're currently just observational research studies. But those types of approaches to patient care have to start from somewhere. And that's really where the observational studies come in. One thing I would add to that is for patients who's, who have already had surgery in the past, you know, in order for us to do anything with the existing tissue, we need patient's permission. So none of those can be done if we actually don't get a consent from you. So that's why some of the ones that we are doing now, we are prospectively getting consent. That's what Tommy does. He goes prior to surgery, really asking if it's okay if you were to contribute a piece of your tissue. So we can do anything with what's already taken without actually getting patient's permission. Okay, thank All you right. so much, thank Tommy. You. Thank you.